Um, good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm Amila. Uh, as uh, Ishara said, uh, I lead the WSO2 uh, cloud team, which hosts the uh, WSO2 public cloud. So uh, if you are a person who is responsible for a deployment, uh, uh, maybe it's a small, medium, or large deployment, uh, and if you have like a different set of stakeholders breathing over your neck, uh, on its availability, then uh, you are in the right session uh, to share some knowledge uh, which we have gained like running uh, these deployments in the uh, past uh, few years. So uh, I'll be talking about like getting more nines from your deployment. Now to begin with, like uh, if I ask you uh, which has more nines, uh, the, the top one or the bottom one? Okay, one said the bottom one. Uh, so in numerical perspective, uh, the top one has more nines, but uh, on a, a deployment perspective, or in the uh, availability perspective, uh, the bottom one is having more nines. So it's having three nines, uh, the top one is only having one nine, because like we measure the, the availability, in the, so this concept called uh, measuring the availability in the nines. Right, so in uh, this session, so uh, I'll first go uh, take you through some of the challenges uh, which affects the availability or the, which affects the nines of your deployment. And uh, then I'll talk about uh, uh, architecting, or de architecting the deployment. And uh, then when architecting and doing the deployment, I'll talk about the importance of DevOps and uh, then uh, the monitoring aspects and uh, communication, which you might not think is, uh, which is important, but it is very important, uh, and some of the best practices. And also I noticed that uh, my clock is set to 25 minutes, okay. Right, uh, so actually uh, Lakmal covered some of, the, uh, some of the things which I want to talk, so then in that case I'll, I'll be able to uh, skip some of the things. So on challenges, so the thing is, in, in the deployments in software world, uh, the failures are in inevitable because humans write the software and uh, humans uh, deploy them and uh, they maintain them uh, due to uh, various reasons, failures are inevitable. There can be hardware reasons, there can be uh, human factors, uh, power failures or bugs. In. So we know the, the softwares have bugs, there, there aren't any uh, bug, free, bug free software. Uh, so because of that, uh, those, they, they, they affect the avail availability. And uh, we also know that we have to do maintenance. Uh, maintenance in the sense like there, there can be housekeeping tasks. Uh, you'll have to uh, patch the uh, software, the patch the deployment uh, because of the bugs. Uh, then you will also have to do upgrades because like you can't run uh, your deployment or the solution with the same set of software because uh, they keep upgrading uh, with the time that they evolve. So you need to bring the latest versions to cater your uh, stakeholders or the end users or uh, the, the internal departments. And uh, there can be unexpected loads. So uh, let's say uh, now, uh, if your deployment, uh, if it caters the, the internal organization, there, uh, this might not be true. But uh, if you don't have the control over the load, if it's exposed to the external world, uh, then the unexpected loads can be uh, expected. And uh, the other thing is human factor. So now human, fact, uh, human factor can affect in different ways. One is like uh, when people like uh, the, the people who are responsible for maintaining this while they are working on the deployment or uh, while they are working on maintenance, they might make mistakes because um, uh, humans make mistakes. Uh, another thing is like uh, there are some unseen stuff like uh, let's say you, f you have to fire an, fire an employee due to some reason. You know that uh, angry employee can go if they, uh, he, he, he'll go out of the company, but if he has access, then uh, he might end up screwing your deployment if he, if he knows the credentials, if he has access and all those things. Now, th uh, uh, those things has happened in the past. Uh, I have heard of one, uh, one cloud, uh, public cloud deployment which was totally screwed up by an employee who got fired and uh, he went out and he uh, deleted all the data. 
So that's, uh, you can't uh, neglect that factor as well. So I, I, uh, I come to architect the architecting the deployment. Now, uh, this diagram, uh, this I took one from our, uh, one of our documentations. This is a distributed uh, deployment of an, uh, our API manager, uh, distri distributed architecture of our API manager product. So the API manager has uh, these uh, four components. Uh, it, 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 it plays these four roles, uh, the publisher, store, uh, API gateway, and key manager. Now, like when you look at the first, uh, look at, uh, at the first side, like this looks totally fine. Uh, we have a separate publisher, a separate API store, uh, a key manager and a gateway. And we have a registry database separately, a user store database, and an API manager database. Now this looks fine and very distributed and like, yes, this will run, uh, if, you, if you try this, uh, if you try to publish an API, this will work fine. But this is fine only for the happy part. Um, due to some reason, if your key manager goes down, uh, you, you won't be able to uh, you won't be able to generate tokens. Uh, you won't be able to uh, invoke APIs because the key validation fails, and so this has all sort of things. And uh, this is this just works for happy path, and this this can't actually even cater for the for a high load as well. So let's talk about architecting the deployment a little bit more. Uh, now, if you are like if you are a, a customer, uh, the Biggest problem you have is you you are not the person who architected the software. You are buying it from a vendor, so you don't um, you don't know what's happening. You don't have the control of it. But having said that, you can't just relax. You can't just get uh, the software from um, the vendor and deploy it and uh, uh, stay uh, calm because you don't know what, what what are the roles each each components in a distributed deployment they are playing. Uh, where things can go wrong. So because of that, although you are not the architect of the, so, um, the software, you need to know how it works. So that's why, like, uh, as, a, as a vendor, WSO2 do, do these uh, presentations with the customers on, how the, on the architecture. And like most of the times, the customers are also interested in knowing how, how this works, what are the, uh, what are the components, uh, why you need a separate database, why you need a, a SVN, a subversion for synchronizing deployment, those kind of things. Now, when you get to know how the software works, like, you, we, we are like intelligent people, right? Uh, otherwise, we won't be here. So you can like think of the weak points. So you can question the, the vendor. Okay, what, what happens if this goes down? What happens if clustering doesn't work? Will my artifacts get uh, synchronized? What happens if this, uh, the, this VM crash? So you can, uh, you can uh, understand the weak points and uh, you can challenge them. And you can also plan for addressing those weak points. And the other thing is now, uh, as I talked in the previous diagram, uh, high availability, so we are talking about availability, High availability is the most important thing for each of these components. So you need to have, like, if, it, if, it's, an, uh, if it's an internal deployment, if you're catering your organization, uh, the, the different departments, uh, you might be able to survive with a nine to six uh, um, time period of availability, because if, uh, assuming the in, uh, only the employees work it, uh, you're using it. But if it's available for in the entire world, or if, if the people in different time zones are using that, uh, then you can't uh, relax like that. Then you, d you don't have time window to do maintenance. So because of that, you need to have this uh, high availability for the components in case you have to do some maintenance or if something goes wrong, there should be another back, uh, uh, either a hot or a cold instance uh, running in parallel to each of the component. So you need to think about each component and make them highly available. Uh, then comes the load balancing factor. So uh, when, you, when you have multiple instances running, it's, uh, it's obvious you need load balancing between them. And also, uh, now there can be, uh, now th that's, the, that's the most common scenario, just load balance uh, your traffic to, uh, let's say, uh, if it's API gateway, you load balance your traffic to, the, let's say, two or three instances you have. But there are some other advanced scenarios as well. Uh, assuming that you want to roll out a new, uh, let's say, a new API, new version of the API. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe it's not a good idea to simply uh, push the new uh, new API to the, the live system and open the traffic for that one. But rather, it would be uh, wiser. Uh, it would be wiser to like route a small portion of the traffic to the new API and uh, the large portion to the old API, and then do some uh, testing 
uh, or like uh, monitor it for certain time and then like gradually move all the traffic to the new one. So those kind of load balancing scenarios are also there. Now something you need to do at the very beginning is capacity planning. Now when you are talking with the vendor, um, like you need to have some idea about like how much of traffic you are going to get through this uh, system. Now as a vendor, we ask from customers uh, how much of traffic like you expect. Like we, ac we at least, uh, we at least uh, expect an answer from them, them in the sense of like, okay, uh, per, per, uh, per a given day, we'll be getting like uh, 10,000 uh, requests or 500 requests, something like that. Uh, at if it, it's better if we can, they can provide a, an answer on like per hour basis because then we know, okay, uh, given a certain, uh, let's say for a minute or an hour, there can be this much of traffic. Uh, and like this, uh, okay, 500 million per year is not going to help because like from that 500 million, maybe like 300 will come will be coming in one month, and uh, all the, the 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 remaining 11 months will be having only 200 million. So that's not going to decide what kind of a load it will be generating. And then uh, the resource allocation. So. Uh, Resource allocation means like one thing is like the size of, sizes of the VMs and uh, how much memory we are going to allocate and those things. Those things like you normally like consider, but uh, uh, there's something else. For example, uh, things like disk, disk space. Now you might think, okay, disk space is like, okay, uh, if there are artifacts to be uh, deployed, like if, uh, if you are deploying artifacts heavily, yes, disk space might be important, but there's, there are some other things as well. For example, logs. Now logs get printer, printed to the disk, disk. Uh, like there might be certain scenarios, like the server keeps printing uh, errors or exceptions, or due to high, high traffic, uh, it keeps printing a lot of logs, and suddenly the disk, disk goes full, and uh, the JVM crashes, so it, it, it stops responding. Now like you, want, you, uh, you might not know what happened, and you will be like looking for everywhere uh, what went wrong. So you need to like have an understanding on how much of this space also this product needs. And then the other thing is potential failures. That is like you need to think of like what if this component fails. For example, uh, if uh, let's take a, a, a very critical part, so a, a very critical part of the deployment or the uh, scenario, for example, publishing an API in the API manager. So I'm taking API manager as a, a frequent example. Uh, what happens if uh, the, the gateway node fails when you are publishing the API? Now, if the gateway node fails, uh, obviously, uh, obviously the API you can't like invoke any APIs, and uh, you need to understand like what happens if it fails, and you need to like check with the vendor. Okay, do you have any backup plans for that one? Like, uh, is the system capable of handling these failures? Especially if you are if you are deploying this in the cloud, you need to uh, you need to uh, expe expect the failures and the, the Code should be programmed to handle these failures. Now we let's assume that we have uh, like taken those decisions on architect in, architect in the deployment, and then you need so uh, you need to hand over the deployment to some group. That group is uh, the ops team or the uh, the DevOps team. Now. Uh, when uh, when I checked for the definition of on the DevOps, because like we, there are like a lot of gray areas on this, so it says a cross-disciplinary community of practice dedicated to the study of building, evolving, and operating rapidly changing resilient systems at scale. So I like this last part: uh, rapidly changing resilient system at scale. So your system, like, it can change rapidly, and also it needs to scale. So. Because of that, like when you are handing over the deployment or when you are asking your DevOps team to uh, deploy, so the most important thing is they, ha they, they should be able to automate the deployment. Like uh, by following a certain in document or uh, some instructions, the DevOps team would be able to set up the deployment perfectly. But uh, due to some reason, like we, for example, disaster recovery purposes or something goes wrong, like if they like, let's say let's think like if it took two weeks to set up the deployment and in a disaster situation if they also take two more weeks to uh, set it up again then uh, you are screwed. So you, they need to automate every part of it, and I think Lakmal also mentioned the importance of that one. Uh, now when automating the deployment, configuration management also comes into picture. So there are a lot of configuration files, there are passwords, um, and uh, different different. Uh, components play different roles, so uh, 
uh, there, there, so there can be scenarios like the same product playing multiple roles in a single deployment. The other good example is API Manager. It plays multiple roles, Publisher, Store, Key Manager, Gateway. So you need to have proper configuration management. So uh, you should use some tools like uh, Puppet, Chef, uh, or some uh, other tool. There can be your own ways, but uh, there should be some way of managing the configuration. And the other thing is uh, scheduling maintenance. Now, let's say um, you need to do frequent maintenance, but you can't do it whenever you want, because as each and every maintenance task means there is a possibility of uh, it affecting your availability. So you need to like group these uh, maintenance tasks uh, into uh, a, a session and like uh, carry out the maintenance work. And uh, the other important thing is backup and uh, backup and restoration. If something goes wrong, obviously you need to have backups. But as Lakmal said, having backups won't help if you haven't done any restoration drills. So you need to do restoration drills uh, in some environment. So you can't do the restoration drills in live because uh, obviously you can't. So you need to take the backups from the live and at least restore them in a staging environment. Uh, to make sure those backups are real. So after the deployment is done, you have to monitor, monitor, and monitor it. Uh, you need to monitor it in all the, way, all the possible ways you can. So I'll talk mon about monitoring in the next slide. Uh, while you're monitoring, you need, to, uh, you need to take those results. You, uh, you, you need to like, uh, get the information you get from monitoring, and you need to tune the deployment. So a vendor, uh, a vendor might be like, uh, like uh, sh shipping their products with uh, default parameters. Now, when it, uh, those parameters might not suit uh, the your scenario. So you need to like uh, figure out those parameters and tune the deployment in a way that they use like minimal resources and they don't go, uh, they don't consume uh, too much resource and they don't go out of memory and those kind of things. So you need to uh, tune the parameters. So uh, when it comes to monitoring, one one thing is you def uh, definitely you need alerts, but the the, the key thing is you need those alerts to be coming in advance, not after something goes wrong. For example, a good scenario is a server is now, uh, uh, due to some bug, due to some memory leak, a server is uh, going out of memory frequently. Now, one thing you might be doing is you will be racing it with the vendor, that's one thing, but at least uh, until you get a patch, you need to be aware of those incidents in advance and at least to do a restart or something, you need to know when the memory hits a certain level. Um, it's useless that you get alert when the memory goes to 100 percent. So that's why you need to get them in advance, and also uh, you have to be smart with the alerts. When you are being smart with the alerts, one thing is like uh, if you are getting false alarms, then you will start neglecting the, those things. So you need to be like first thing is you need to uh, uh, act on all the alerts, and if there are any false alarms, you need to uh, you need to rectify your monitoring tools. And the other thing is. Uh, you need to know, okay, let's say due to the, after capacity planning and all those things, your server might be still consuming 50% of memory to cater the, or to deliver the um, traffic. So in that case, 50% of memory is something you can accept. So if you have like uh, configured alerting systems to uh, alert to when it uh, goes beyond 50%, which means there's high probability, you will be getting a lot of alerts uh, because the memory can be fluctuating between 50, 60 kind of things. So you need to be smart. And there are three ways of monitoring. One is like, uh, so you, your deployment might be running on a physical server, which is not much recommended, or in the VMs. So you need to uh, measure the VM health in the, in the uh, aspects of the disk space, the load average, and uh, uh, how, how much IO it consumes. And then uh, the, the individual JVM health. So if you are running multiple JVMs in one server, then you need to know what each JVM is consuming. Now, having said that, it's also important to check the functionality of the deployment as well. Now, let's say, uh, let's say a customer complains, uh, complains to you about saying, okay, I can't create APIs. And uh, then you talk to the DevOps team and ask, okay, what's up with the, uh, the API cloud deployment? Then they look at the monitoring system and they say, oh, nothing, nothing wrong, it's like all cool. But uh, the thing is, the server might be up, 
the memory will be okay, but due to some reason, uh, the functionality is not working. So you need to be aware, aware of those things, which means like uh, you need a way of checking the functionality. Now to check the functionality, you need to have some uh, automated test, or we call the uh, integration test, uh, running against a deployment, like simulating this uh, the functionality. Those can be uh, what uh, this um, Selenium test or the, some uh, some other Java tool which uh, simulates the functionality. So in our API Cloud deployment, uh, so we have all this uh, monitoring. So we have written our own tool to uh, simulate the functionality. So we know that. Uh, we know that uh, although the servers are up, something is not working. So these are some of the screenshots which I have taken from our monitoring tools, uh, from Nagios, uh, Isinga. So this one is from the, it's kind of blurred. This is from that tool I mentioned. So we are checking the functionality and uh, drawing it, um, so sorry, uh, displaying it, uh, to see whether the functionality is working. Now the, the another important thing is um, communication. Now there are three kind of communication which needs to happen when it comes to a important or a critical deployment. First thing is the communication which happens between the vendor and you. You means like you are the responsible person for this uh, the, the, the deployment. So you need to understand the initial deployment. As I said, you need to understand how it works, the architecture, and what are the weak, weak components, and all those things. And uh, during the initial phase, you need to uh, have a good communication with the vendor. And uh, if you are doing an upgrade, then also you need to have a good communication with the vendor. For example, uh, let's say now WSO2 releases a newer version of the product. And uh, now with those releases, uh, we release these uh, upgrade instructions as well. So we tell, okay, uh, we tell, okay, we have this uh, a, a component. Uh, put this into the, ja the, the JVM and the, the product and start it, and it will do the migration. But that's that might not be enough because you need to understand, okay, what what is it, what what's it doing? So it might be changing some files. It might be uh, changing some database values. So because there might be certain things which the vendor doesn't know, but you know because you have done certain things in certain ways. So you need to be aware of those things and like map the instructions to your deployment. Then you can like, as an intelligent person, you can detect okay something might go wrong in this space. And uh, also when it comes to patching, now when when you are applying patching, certain patches might be simple. You just copy it and restart it. But there can be certain other patches where uh, you have to do some configuration changes or you have to do some migration as well. So the communication between the vendor and you is important. And now you have gathered that information from the vendor. Now you need to communicate that to your DevOps team as well. Um, so when doing that, uh, for example, if you want to, uh, you want to apply a patch. So uh, the, some, something we do is like we submit these maintenance jobs. And there are maintenance days. Like we don't apply patches throughout the entire week. So if we have patches to be applied, if we have configuration changes to be made, like we group them and uh, we, we submit maintenance jobs and the DevOps team, they will carry out in, uh, in the given maintenance days and before doing that, they will be, uh, they'll be doing it in a staging environment and verifying it and they'll be raising any concerns and uh, then we can like uh, rectify those things. And uh, most importantly, there should be a checklist. Now. Uh, the thing is, like the, the, the most knowledgeable person in the in the who's handling the deployment should be aware of where can things go wrong. What uh, when you st restart the server, uh, where can things uh, affect the users? For example, if the UI is not going to be available, then it's ad it is advisable to raise a maintenance banner saying, uh, "Okay, we are closed for maintenance from this time to this time." So. Then the DevOps person who is carrying out the maintenance should know. Okay, before restarting the server, I need to put the maintenance banner, and then only I can restart it. And after restarting, I need to remove the maintenance banner. So those kind of things should be in a checklist. Uh, that's a very simple thing, but there can be a very complex uh, checklist as well. Because things are critical. Now, people do mistakes, and you can't let them uh, do mistakes. And the other thing is the communication between you, the deployment owner, or the solution owner, and the end user. If the end user is the, the internal uh, the organization people, then it's okay. You can like communicate to them, when, or if something goes wrong, like you can tolerate that. But if uh, you don't have the control over the end users, uh, then you need to be no notify them in advance. And also, like you should like try to at least make part of the deployment available during the maintenance work because like that will make them happy. 
Like if you can't create new APIs, at least the already already uh, created APIs, already published APIs should work. So like otherwise, like they will drive them nuts. That's the whole purpose of like they are using our let's say a cloud deployment. It should be available. So if you can't make the entire deployment available, at least make a part of it available. So some best practices. Uh, you need to have a checklist. If you don't use checklist, then it's like better you, when, when you go back like to think about it and come up with some checklist because it can save some of your sleep time. Uh, then you need to define processes. Uh, now, process, uh, process is like, it defines how this thing can be, this thing should be carried out. Uh, a checklist helps to, a checklist comes in the middle of that one. So when you are like applying a patch, uh, a process says like, okay, this should be tried in staging and uh, certain other things. And uh, it helps you to verify that the, per the person who carried out the, the task followed it by like uh, checking, with the uh, checking a copy of the checklist. So in the, in the old days, they had these uh, uh, papers where they have to tick these certain, certain things. And now you can have a checklist kind of Excel sheet or something where they mark it as done, done, done. And they have to submit that checklist after they carry out the task. Then you need automated, automated test after doing certain changes in the deployment. They can, you can quickly run the automate, automated test and it will provide you a uh, uh, status of the health of the system. Uh, if the check, uh, tests are failing, you know something has gone wrong, so you can revert it and uh, look into that later. So you, you need uh, one or more staging setups. Uh, you need dev setups, staging setups, uh, all those things to be sure, like trying things before you uh, go into live. And um, the another thing is like you need to script certain operations. Script means like not these puppet scripts or shell scripts. There should be a script uh, like a, 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 a teledrama script. So how things going to happen? Okay. So we'll be shutting down this instance. We'll be putting the banner. We'll be then taking copy of uh, this database and um, restoring it. So th th that so this script depends on tasks. Like there are like uh, from task to task it depends. And someone needs to prepare the script, and the person who is having the best knowledge on the system should review that and see, okay, whether this covers everything. Uh, reviewing this before the operation is carried out can save you from a lot of humiliation and a lot of trouble. Uh, I have done that, and I, I, it has it has saved our reputation in quite a uh, quite many, uh, quite a few times. And the other thing is, you need to do drills by following these scripts. And uh, also, after f this task, uh, you need to do postmortems as well because it helps you to under understand like where can, where could have like uh, where could we have like done things better and what went wrong and all those things. And finally, like you need to make your DevOps also highly available. I mean, the, the humans also highly available. So you might be uh, comfortable with a, one person who is familiar with, let's say, who is familiar with the setup, like doing all the things, and if that person gets sick or he gets hit by a bus, then the next person who is taking over should know nothing and like things will go like into chaos. So uh, that the people also should be highly available, which means they should be, they should know the stuff, they, like there should be more than one pe person who can uh, handle the things. So the takeaways are, uh, it's better to define processes and uh, also create checklist, which will help you to follow those processes well and uh, have some scripts for the important tasks and review them in, in advance and do some drills by following those scripts and uh, verify uh, things before pushing it to live. So this is something I like very much. Uh, this the, 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 the Sri Lankan audience will know this, so if I convert it into uh, English, it says, although the patients are uh, although the patients are in a hurry, especially the psychiatric patients, the, the doctor doctor should not uh, get panicked. Now, the, in, in, in our case, the patients are the stakeholders. For example, people might be asking, uh, okay, I want that patch deployed tomorrow, like, will you be doing it for me or not? And uh, so I would say, okay, hold on. Uh, although you want it urgently, uh, we can't do it like that. We have our own ways. We have because I am responsible for the deployment. I am responsible for the uh, availability. I'll do it in my way, and you just back off. I'll uh, I'll make it uh, get it done by next Friday, and uh, and I'll promise you that it will it will be available on Friday. So there are critical stuff which sometimes you will have to like uh, 
jump the queue and do certain things. But the thing is, like, you should know what you are doing, and you should, uh, if you are in the control, uh, uh, you should not panic and do the right thing. So we like we use this term uh, uh, all the time in uh, within our team. Okay. So finally, like. Uh, uh, as a deployment owner, you should fight for a, a resilient architecture, uh, although you are not the person who is architecting the product and all those things. Uh, so I'm running out of my time. So I, I have already run, off, run out of my time. So what I am requesting you from you is like fight for a resilient architecture. And also, uh, if you want your deployment to be managed by WSO2 team uh, in, a, in a highly available manner with a lot of nines, uh, then WSO2 has, uh, the cloud team has these managed cloud services. You can uh, go to that URL, wso2.com slash cloud slash manage, and you can read the documentation and what kind of SLA we provide, and if you're interested, uh, you can request for some managed cloud services as well. Yeah.